This is a dark time. The evil wizard mundane sends forth relentless hordes of his demonic minions to ravage the lands of Britannia. Thou art the one of whom the prophets speak. Who among you will rise to challenge the evil wizard? Who will brave the darkest depths of the earth and the farthest reaches of outer space? Who will track the foul mundane to his hidden lair and put an end to the darkness he has cast upon Britannia? The ultimate quest awaits you. Oh shit, what's going on? Star Wars, nothing but How Star am I supposed Wars. to get over there? Can't put this reference in my video. Cause the nerds will know. Originally released for the Apple II, I would say in the spring of 1981. Wikipedia says June with no citations, but the first review actually came in June, and that's not how magazines work. More likely to be in, you know, March or April of 81. Today we'll be covering Ultima, later renamed Ultima 1 and subtitled The First Age of Darkness. It was developed by Lord British, aka Richard Garriott, and published by Top of the Orchard Software slash California Pacific Computers in its original incarnation on the Apple II. Sierra would port the game to the Atari 800 and publish it through themselves, and that was it for the original versions. Gary, at largely fueled by his dislike of Sierra and their handling of Ultima 1 and 2, would form his own company along with his brother, Origin, and they would later re-release this game. The new versions will be put out for the Apple II, the Commodore 64, and DOS in America. Japan would see releases for the PC-88, the MSX, and the Sharp X1, and much later on, through a third party, there was an Apple II GS release. Today we'll be covering the Commodore 64 version, which I believe to have been released in January of 1987, directly after the Apple II re-release in December of 86. We'll start with a look at the manual here in its original 1981 form, but we will be reading from the re-released version. Now, I believe this to have been written after the 1981 release, so feel free to roll your eyes. We're going to read it anyway. Hail, noble one. Our land is in need of a starred hero, one who will brave perils too horrific to consider. A plague has befallen the realm. A scourge is upon the land. Our villages lie sacked. All manner of wicked and vile creatures prey upon our people and ravage the land. Tis the doing of one so evil that the very earth trembles at the mention of his name. Our nobles bicker amongst themselves, and each hath retired to the confines of his keep in hopes of watching the downfall of his arrivals. Nowhere in our once peaceful country may a traveler finds safe passage or lodging, save in the keeps of the self-proclaimed kings. Only the young Lord of British, you know, not self-proclaimed there or anything, remains steadfast in his vision of a peaceful and united Caesarea. In his castle and his town, the pure of heart will find an ally and replenishment for the needs of one who hath chosen to fight for the realm. Eat us in ridding our land of the scourge that hath befallen us, O noble one. We beseech thee, for without thine aid we shall surely perish before the onslaught of the malfeasant necromancer. Slay the evil mundane. And we have a description of the four races at our disposal. The human, elf, dwarf, and bobbit, which I imagine is a take on the hobbit. I like how it describes the elves as being excellent musicians, as if we could play as a bard or something, which we can't. If there is a reason to choose one race over another, it is surely not made clear to us. Which is a disappointment, considering we only have one character in our party. It would be nice if we could feel as if our choice in race actually meant something. Even the assigning of the attributes in the beginning, I feel, mean very little in our journey. That said, I enjoyed being able to play as a single character. I wouldn't want that in every RPG, but as a change of pace, I enjoy it. Now, in terms of the gameplay, Ultima is considered a role-playing game. Funny enough, in the Ultima style, fancy that. While I feel others quickly reach the cringe category when discussing games in an epic style, just for one moment here, in all seriousness, in the beginning, with computer role-playing games, we had Temple of Apshai, Wizardry, and... Ultima. 
this is a granddaddy. Pretty much all RPGs going forward, be it CRPGs, Japanese RPGs, action RPGs, took from those three games I mentioned. Of course, all of those games taking from real life, in person, Dungeons and Dragons. I would actually place this as an action RPG. The role playing, the combat, and the leveling is very simplistic here. Now, it has the very good excuse of being from 1981 on its side, but still, all things considered, this is without a doubt the easiest RPG I have ever played in my entire life. I'm including Japanese RPGs, I'm including action RPGs. This one, right here, the easiest. Now, please don't take that as a slight on the game. As a matter of fact, I think this was the perfect entry for me in terms of the classic Ultimus. My history with these games go way back from watching my father play 3 through 6 on the Amiga. I think I even remember him playing this on the 64, which is really going back. But unlike when he played the Golden Box games or I the Beholder, the Ultima games never held my attention as a kid. The only one I ever got into and actually beat was Ultima 9, the one everybody else hates. And it wasn't for a lack of trying. My version of Ultima 9 was a collector's edition, which came with everything prior to that. I tried to play all of these Ultima games, but in the end, gave up quickly. So just because I say this is the easiest RPG I've ever played and beaten, well, all RPGs are difficult to get into at the start. And I feel like Ultima fans don't give this one the respect it deserves in terms of, you know, trying to get other people to come to these games. They always want you to start with the fourth one because it's the one that affected them so much. Well, not everybody wants to be preached at. And I feel if you start with those later games, you will never end up liking this one as much as I do, which is a real shame. And it's not like other games where going back to the first installment might offer you a very archaic graphics experience or something. They all pretty much look like this from one through five. I'm excited to play the other Ultimas now. In my opinion, this is the one to start with. Speaking of the simplistic combat, this is about as strategic as it's gonna get. You can use the terrain a little bit to your advantage. Not that it's gonna do me any good in this particular case. Primarily, you're pressing A to attack, in my case on the 64, pressing fire and the direction of the enemy. There's a tiny bit more strategy with the spells, although the spell system isn't that grand either. The classes are pretty much like the races, no noteworthy differences between them. Although playing as a thief, ironically, might help you defeat the game in a more honorable fashion. Perhaps that would play better on your soul, considering the virtuous style this series would become known for. Whilst not a profession held in the highest esteem among those charged with maintaining the public order, thieving is a trait that often serves the adventurer well. Larceny and the opening of locks comes much easier for the thief than for other mortals, for they who follow this occupation are endowed with exceptional agility. So morally, would it be better to kill a jester or pickpocket the power them? Of Your choice. The knowledge to get me the fuck off this island? Nice bug there. Soft talk, June of 1981. You take two to four months off of that, you get a fairly accurate release date, Wikipedia. An original advertisement from Top of the Orchard Software. Notice how it says it was designed by Lord British. That is going to come into play later. Once in a while, a product appears in the market that truly seems to reach the ultimate development of a genre. The phenomenon occurs more often than usual in this infant industry of microcomputing, and also peculiar to this industry, such products are often surpassed in relatively short order. Aptly named Ultima fits the first description, but is likely not to succumb to the second for some time. There is no doubt that eventually it will be surpassed, however, if only by its own author, Lord British. What we can expect from him in years to come is beyond imagination. Ultima is a role-playing adventure game of the high-res, set-command variety rather than the text deduce the vocabulary type. Although there are dungeons in Ultima, they are only a portion of the program. Through the rest of the game, your character can roam an entire above-ground world. Only Bob Clarity, with his wilderness campaign and odyssey, has paved the way for this style, both of which taking place outdoors. There are continents, lakes, rivers, oceans. There are towns and castles, and of course, dungeons. Although the game begins in medieval times, as you grow in experience and strength, the times progress. Technological development makes new products available, and eventually, you reach the space stage. I wouldn't exactly call that accurate. 
The dungeons look almost like those in Lord's earlier work, Akelabeth. They look exactly like Akelabeth, as a matter of fact. Subtle changes in the construction of the dungeons make them clearly second generation. Nothing subtle makes anything clearly second generation. In Ultima, Lord Bridges has created a fast-paced, detailed, imaginative role-playing masterpiece in full-color high-res. If you like this kind of game at all, this one isn't to be missed. And if you like space travel and skilled games, you'll get that here too, although you have to work for it. This review does not begin to cover all the events available in Ultima, and it gives you no strategy. A lot of the fun is in discovery, and there's much to discover. $39.95 California Pacific Computer Company, Davis, California. Review apparently from MCT. No idea who that is. So as we buy some upgraded plate mail, as well as a sword, let's talk about the economy a little bit, which the magazine got a little bit into. It's fairly decent. It's better than some games which came ten years later, actually. It's not based off of time, like the magazine claimed. Generations are not passing here. Some of it is based on the town you are in. Certain towns offer certain weapons. Some don't even offer weapons. The rest of it, I would imagine, is based off of your experience. Perhaps money factors into it a little bit as well. The more monsters you kill, the more XP you get. Eventually, more items start becoming available to you. I would think if you cheated in the XP and money, you could instantly go to space. So time is not passing. In the beginning, you got to make some choices. You get 100 coin. Do you want to blow it all on some chain mail? Or you want to compromise like we did. We bought a mace to upgrade from the dagger. We got some leather armor. We bought some food, but we could also have maybe bought some magic spells. I was always excited to get to a new town, especially on the first continent, because they all look different. The other continents repeat the first continent's cities. But each new city, I felt like I was getting something new. And I had to make some choices, too. I could have gotten the air car at the end of the first continent, but instead I got a frigate because you know, I was concerned. I didn't know. I was playing it a little conservatively. But through the third continent, we were still upgrading our weapons and armor. Still, eventually, you will get you know to the point where it's 9,999 gold and you really have nothing else to buy. But for a game from 1981, it does pretty well well with the economy. I have to say I found the dungeons to be the most delightful surprise. I certainly wasn't expecting much from the screenshots I've seen before, but here on the Commodore 64 and on a CRT television, beautiful. It's literally two colors, black and white, but I think it might look better than Might Magic 1 from 1986. In person, it's this beautiful, warm glow. You almost feel like you're playing a Vectrex. It's a point for the 64, actually, because not all versions look like this. Sometimes less is more, and I just cannot believe how wonderfully, uniquely drawn these monsters are. This spider here scared me, truly. And really, the design is an Akelabeth holdover from 1979. They're randomly, or more accurately, procedurally generated when you start the world. So that first dungeon we entered, we couldn't really go anywhere. If we go back to that one now, it's going to look the same. But somebody else coming to this, they're going to get something completely different. And we could have used a ladder spell in that dungeon to have gone down a little further. Or sometimes there are secret doors, but I never really looked for those. I did not hand map any of these, which I would normally recommend, both for fun and for the overall pacing of the game. Here there are no items, there's no story. The only point in going into a dungeon is to kill the monster. Monsters. So unless you get lost easily, I don't think there's a point in mapping. I had fun just wandering around. Uh, again, I like mapping games, but you know, as a change of pace here, I enjoyed not mapping this one. Back to Soft Talk, October 81 where we have a sales chart put together from Apple franchised retail stores, which represent 5% of the overall market. Number eight this month, number eight last month, Ultima. Some actual sales numbers about a year later from Computer Gaming World, September, October, 82. Number 11 in the top sellers with 20,000 units sold. This is a survey from 150 different computer software manufacturers. So that's directly from California Pacific. Take it with a grain of salt. Also, companies like Atari did not want to be a part of this. So I imagine an Atari game is probably a little higher on that list as well. It also says June of 81, which you would think is a release date, but it just cannot possibly line up with the Soft Talk review, which was from June. June, unless they had a preview copy, and usually magazines had the integrity to let you know about that. Computer Game World's actual review came at the beginning of 1982, January, February. <gasps> we did it. 
a review before Scorpia. We found the Holy Grail. <laughs> Chris Tierter here could have been Scorpia before the pseudonym. Then again, Scorpia could be three men and a lady. We don't know. It's a persona. Only Russell Sipe and whoever is made up of Scorpia know the truth on that one. I really hope you know, she shows herself someday. Ultima is one of the best computer fantasy role-playing games to date. One unique feature of Ultima is that the technology improves as the game goes on. At the end, the player is in outer space in a very well-done arcade-like segment. The dungeons in Ultima are drawn in 3D graphics, similar to those in Akelabeth, but of higher quality. It's really not that much higher quality. As technology improves, so do the available armor and weapons. At first, nothing better than a mace will be available, but near the end, the player can buy or steal phasers, blasters, vacuum suits, and reflect armor. You know, it is possible for a fantasy game to have a coexisting science fiction element without generations passing. There is nothing in this game which states that. It's all in your head. Don't add to the story. The only real bug this program has is reincarnation. It is possible to reincarnate into the middle of the ocean five years later and they didn't fix that one. Completely rewritten in assembly language, yet it looks pretty much the same and it has the same bugs. Okay. The other disappointment is incomplete documentation, although what is there is nice. Deirdre L. Malloy. Of course, we all know Scorpy had to say something about it someday, right? October 1991. This first game in the series is truly epic in scope. Aside from a large land with dungeons to explore, eras pass from primitive to high tech, providing ever better weapons, armor, and transportation. All right, you forced me to look it up from the original nine page manual with no story except for this excuse. As the game continues, the computer keeps track of time and slowly increases the technology of the world, allowing you to buy better and stronger weapons. My Apologies to Scorpia, Deirdre, and Soft Talk. Apparently, we are immortal. Thousands of years are passing. You know, none of this is said in the game, and really, it's not said in the manual either. That is just an excuse. One of the first games of its time to have a real outdoors. Most in the genre were busily pushing you through underground passageways. There's the Scorpio we all love. This game also introduced talking to people to pick up clues, although in a much more rudimentary form than the current Ultimus. A classic not to be missed. And finally, according to the readers of Computer Gaming World, Ultima is the seventh best game. I remember that ad earlier which said Lord British designed the game? Here's two pages, five times Sierra gets mentioned. No Richard Garriott, no Lord British. Stay classy, Ken Williams. So let's get a little bit more into the story. There's nothing in the original manual. That blip there about generations passing, I think, is just a way to get you to explore so you don't sit there in the same area and farm XP. Which is apparently how a lot of people play this game today. We're not talking speed runs, we're talking regular long plays. They sit there and they go to the signpost over and over again. There's like nine dungeons per continent, they only go to one. That is not how to personally have fun, that is not how to get a viewer to have fun. Now in game I would say there's about two pages of story and another page at the very end. Thou hast best known that over 1000 years ago, Mondane the wizard created an evil gem. With this gem he is immortal and cannot be defeated. The quest of Ultima, nice fourth wall break, is to traverse the lands in search of a time machine. Upon finding such a device, thou should go back in time to the days before Mondane created the evil gem and destroy him. While I feel taverns should be an important location in RPGs, and too often they are not, I feel these guys know a little too much. Most of the story is told either through the taverns or through the kings, which makes a lot more sense there. It's a tale as old as time, there's a bad guy we have to get rid of, but the journey to get rid of him, going through space and time. Short, but memorable. Speaking of taverns, the people of our land are not without a certain fondness for strong spirits and lively companionship. Most of them are graced with public houses, where a tankard of strong ale from the regions of Trinsic, or a flagon of the best Jalom mead may be had for but a few coins. Many of the people found in these taverns are quite friendly, and the ones serving the drinks are often fountains of wisdom and gossip. From the official book of Ultima by Shay Adams, who was as notable as Scorpia, minus the bullshit. It was in the fall of 1979, when Garriott moved into the closet to commence work on the first Ultima while in school. A Calibus 3D subroutine, which depicts the view down a dungeon, was the only element of that program that went into Ultima 1. Clearly second generation. Garriott worked on Ultima throughout his freshman year in college and completed it in little more than a year. It wasn't called Ultima 1 because no one even guessed it was going to be a sequel and was published by California Pacific in 1980. Why is there so much misinformation about release dates? It was published in 1981 and it's extra embarrassing because he mentions Mount St. Helens and John Lennon. He 
not only put himself in the game as Lord British, but also as King Shemino. His habit of saying hello rather than hi made him sound British, and since he'd been born in England, the name stuck. Just as a Kelepeth had scored well with the growing legions of computer gamers, Ultima took off like an out-of-control air car, selling more than 50,000 copies. By the middle of the decade, Gary regained the rights to the game from California Pacific. He had it rewritten in assembly language by programmers at his own company, Origin, in the winter of 1986. Byte, December 81. They cost less and give you more for your money. Read our chart. The easiest role-playing game I've ever played is a game for experts. Number five, from darkest dungeons to deepest space, this extravagant claim is fulfilled by the game Ultima, a graphics-oriented role-playing game by yes. Lord British for the Apple II or II Plus. To the re-release version that we are playing, Questbusters, December 1986. Conversion update. Ultima 1 is the ship for the Apple this month, probably January for the Commodore, and it looks like Ultima 4 won't be ready for the IBM until at least January. So in terms of the timeline, this is Ultima 4 Era. Questbusters is published monthly by the Adams Expedition. Copyright Shea Adams. Copy without permission is punishable by having both your arms traded to Iran to free more hostages. I regret nothing! The review for the re-released version, March 1987. This review, penned by Ronald Thwarto, a serious computer gaming generation gap has just been filled. Ultima 1, the classic beginning of the popular Ultima fantasy role-playing series, has been released by Origin Systems, Lord British's own company, originally released in 1980. I see no evidence from 1980 other than from Shea Adams' publications. Earliest reviews from June of 81, it wouldn't take six months, guys. Most were from the fall and winter of 1981, going into 1982. Ultima 1 was available only on the Apple and the Atari 8-bit. However, the game has been unavailable on either for several years. That is also untrue. An entire generation of computer gamers has been unable to play this saga, my favorite Ultima, until the fourth scenario. From this antic catalog of games in the winter of 87, we can see that Sierra was very much willing to sell this game to the Atari 800 users. $34.95, that's not a mail order, that's an actual catalog. You think Ken Williams is just going to give up his rights to this game? Now, it wasn't available on the Apple II because California Pacific had gone out of business, but Sierra still selling it on the Atari 800, unless they just brought it back to mess with Origins re-release, which would be hilarious. Much of the solution is very linear progression. This is a non-linear open-world game. Yes, you have quests to do before you can get to Mundane, but you can do any of those quests in any order you feel like. Especially for 1981, the non-linear nature and the open world setting is a crowning achievement for this game. Oh, it's not after midnight. When first released, Ultima 1 carved new and ambitious territory for computer role players and introduced the striking outdoor graphics that have continually improved in each successive game. But not by that much, let's be real. From the striking animated color title sequence to the now familiar twirling cursor, this new old Ultima has much of its successors in it. In keeping with tradition, Origin System includes a stylized manual, four nicely colored cardboard maps, a reference card, and the ever-present doodad, a coin of the realm in a cloth pouch. I highly recommend that all fantasy role-playing fans play this game. It is the easiest of the Ultimas to get started in and complete, and while it doesn't take as long to finish as the others, it isn't so short that it's over in a few hours. For those who have played it before, you're in for a pleasant surprise. With the graphics and speed enhancements, I am often asked what would be a good game to get the feel of fantasy role-playing. Because it was unavailable for years, I could not recommend Ultima 1. Now I can. With a price of $48, probably $39.95, but semantics. Certainly agree with his final thoughts on this being the one to start with, and I extend a round of applause for being the only American source that treated this re-release seriously and reviewed it. Others mentioned it, only Questbusters reviewed it. Let's get more into the graphics, which is what distanced me from these games as a kid. I find the beauty in all kinds of systems. So for me, it had to look worse than the Atari 2600 if I was going to think this looked bad. The tiled graphics in this style remind me of text mode. I find the charm in them now, though I find it difficult to understand how this series got so much credit for increasing the graphics from game to game, when it's essentially the same engine for 11 years. Apparently if it looks the same and it smells the same, all you have to do is get Richard Gary to say he rewrote it, and it's not the same. I feel the Gold Boss games did more from game to game to increase the graphics, yet they got slandered constantly for being the same engine. 
How do you start the code fresh but get not only a similar style of graphics, but things like, you know, people attacking diagonally. The enemies can attack you diagonally, you can't attack them diagonally. That wasn't fixed until the sixth game, which is when the engine was obviously changed. There's some things like the water effect is impressive in person on a CRT. Not so good on the emulators, I've noticed. The water is still on the original Apple II version, though Sierra did add a type of movement effect in the Atari 800 versions. So the game has been enhanced from its original release. Objectively, the Commodore 64 version is the best looking of the 8-bit versions. I think the dungeons are the best looking, period. But it's still effectively the early 80s Apple II high resolution mode, which was 140 by 192, being blown up to fit the Commodore 64's 320 by 200 resolution. The DOS version arguably got more of an upgrade. It's in 320 by 200 anyway. I would say the intro screen is better on an artistic level on DOS, but that it's more atmospheric in its original 8-bit versions. I would say the overworld as well as the towns obviously look better on DOS. It's keeping in mind the severe limitations artistically of EGA. There's no close-ups of faces, for example, so having red skin tones isn't going to rip you out of reality. I would recommend both the DOS and 64 versions at the top of my list. The GS version looks better in some ways, gives you an idea what the Amiga could have looked like, but that it went too far in messing with the dungeons. And with DOS, even when it's better in some respects, it's never better in everything. If there's an Amiga version and the graphics aren't better there, well then the sound and the music would be better there, even on the worst 8-bit systems. The PC speaker is embarrassing. And here with the dungeons, they look better on the 64. Jagged as all hell on DOS. Smooth lines on the 64. I also have a CRT monitor on my DOS machine, but this is showing you the beauty of actual CRT televisions over monitors. I really do love the dungeons on the 64. Looks fantastic. Speaking of the original intro's atmosphere, here is an Easter egg I found partly by myself and partly through reading the night I found by myself. Every fourth intro screen, it appears. The Lamborghini appears every 16th, I believe. And while I mentioned the PC speaker being embarrassing for sound and music. The Commodore 64 here isn't all that much better because it's based on the Apple II's internal speaker. The sound ranges from being merely meh to grating. It's 1986, 87. You couldn't upgrade the sound a little bit. As far as I'm concerned, this game should have a soundtrack like Ultima 3 and Beyond did. In terms of the re-release, sound is the worst part of it. Now, space is cool. It's a little confusing initially, as this section behaves quite realistically. If you thrust forward and you turn around, you'll then be going backwards. You have to thrust in the opposite direction to stop. And I recommend getting the keyboard involved <laughs> in this. Doing it with just the joystick is nearly impossible. I just love science fiction in my RPGs. It's <laughs> such a shame that so many people are perfectly cool with you know, fighting trolls, but you know, get a laser involved and that's just a step too far for them. Though I do feel the game should have done a little better job of making us understand why we are in space now. In terms of the world, nice colored cardboard that came with the re-released versions. And while I did not hand map anything, I certainly referred to the provided maps quite a bit, having printed copies of them to write my own notes. I loved my exploration of the first continent in particular, the second a little less so because I realized that the towns were repeating themselves. I think they would have been better off starting the repetitions of the towns in the first continent, that way you would have saved a couple unique towns for the rest. By the third continent it was feeling very samey, and by the fourth I just wanted to get it all over with. There really is a lot out there to explore. Pointless to some degree because yes, you could just enter one dungeon in the entire game and get everything you need. But the fun is in exploring and the gradual increase of your stats. Your Commodore from Britain, October 1987. Anyone who has ever played the excellent Ultima 3 or even bigger and better Ultima 4 will have wondered how it all started. Playing these games is like watching a film that's already halfway through, but now you can find out how it all began in this released version of the prequel, Ultima 1. Ultima 1 has been rewritten and speeded up for this relaunch and is a must for Ultima adventurers. You may find it a little easy after 3 and 4, but it's still a challenging quest that will lead you to the stars.
Podcast review from TH. 19 pounds, 95 pence, 7 out of 10. As previously stated, the re-release was mentioned in other magazines, but in these cases it was more of a press release. Clearly, these are Origins words, repeating the lie of the game not being available on any format and saying, Now, Origin System brings you the new Ultima One, a significant enhancement of the original, completely rewritten in assembly language and employing states of the art graphics. It certainly runs better in assembly. Disc loading isn't even an issue here on the 64. It does look better than the original. But it also looks the same. These are not state-of-the-art graphics. To get a little more into space, I like the combination of the more realistic physics in the 2D section. Despite what you hear me say in the background, at least once I understood the keyboard end of it, the contrast between this and the 3D section, which is arcade-based, I like the differences there. I always kind of got a chuckle out of the origin slogan, which was, We create worlds. Well, they kind of did a lot of borrowing as well, didn't they? X-Wings, TIE Fighters, computer role-playing games in general, taking from Dungeons and Dragons, you know, their other big series, Wing Commander, taking from Star Trek and Star Wars. And canonically, in an awful retcon, Ultima takes place within the Wing Commander universe. We're actually fighting Kilrathi. Laugh or roll your eyes. Nevertheless, I enjoy the space sections. They were just what I needed to freshen up the gameplay. I kind of wish I would have went to space a little sooner, actually. Computer Gaming World, June, July, 87. CGW's resident adventure game expert offers an editorial on the genre of role-playing games. One of the earliest computer RPGs was Kessel Telengard. It was a rather primitive game in its original state. There was no set goal. You merely wandered through multiple levels of a dungeon, killing monsters, gathering loot, and gaining experience so you could kill more powerful monsters and gather even more loot. It was an unending cycle of hack and slash. Scorpia's most repeated words were hack and slash and foozle. Temple of Epshai soon appeared. This was a more sophisticated version, complete with graphics. It brought some pizzazz to the genre, and CRPGs began to catch on. Then came Wizardry and Ultima 1, causing the floodgates to open. The CRPG has come a long way since Castle Telengard. Or has it? When you strip away the graphics, the fancy weapons, and fancier spells, and get down to the bare bones, what do you find? The same old cycle of hack, loot, gain a level, hack, loot, etc. The addition of a quest, which is almost always kill the evil wizard before he takes over the world, doesn't change it much. Please, editor Russell Sype, I would just love to know why you felt it appropriate to let the resident adventure game expert talk about a completely different genre that she obviously hates. Now, she has a point with wanting a greater emphasis on character development, but it doesn't matter with her, even if the game had excellent character development. If combat gets in the way, she hates it. If it's non-linear, she hates it. Anything that gets in the way of her completing the game faster and thus getting the review out and making money, she doesn't like. Entertaining as all hell and a great writer, not the person to go to for opinions on role-playing games. From Computes Gazette, May of 1989. It listed some Commodore users groups, and I looked up the one from Detroit. It's just some guy's house off of 8 Mile. I guess I didn't realize you know, how personal these things were. Worlds of Fantasy on disc from Neil Randall, with an excellent image there from Electric Brain. With magical kingdoms and mythical creatures, dark forces and heroes of great goodness, fantasy is a popular category of entertainment software. Here's a look at how it began, what it is now, and where it might be going. The role-playing adventure came to the 64 surprisingly late. For the first 18 months of the machine's existence, game players were eagerly awaiting the arrival of Wizardry. By the time Wizardry finally made its appearance, other role-playing systems had entrenched themselves on the 64. The most popular ones were released within a year of each other, Fantasy Ultima and The Bard's Tale. Origin Systems Ultima series has now reached its fifth installment. The system's designer, Lord British, has established a unique, eclectic system with Ultima, establishing as well a reputation for impressive and intelligent revision to the basic system. Those beginning with Ultima four will be immensely surprised if they step back and look at Ultima 1 or 2. The game has matured dramatically. And finally, on the fourth attempt, I cut out one of them because I felt it was too repetitious, we rescue the princess. Not a fan of murdering all these jesters who at least stole something from me, so there's that, but also countless guards. There were plenty of clues pointing to that, but I did it 
three times and it didn't work until the fourth. That rips you out of the game, forces you to look it up, which wouldn't help anyway because everybody else gets the first time. But me, thou hast not the correct key. Apparently I saved the discussion on the magic system for last. I wonder why. Maybe because I only ever used the two ladder spells, and those I actually thought were great. Now say we are to use Magic Missile, which is not a bad spell. We need to go into a separate menu, ready it, then cast it, or we could just, you know, attack normally. I never felt like the benefits of the magic system justified the time spent casting. And in contrast to Scorpio, my definition of hack and slash is simple when all you're doing is pressing A to attack when you're not using the magic system because it's not worth it. To her, if you were to put an emphasis on the combat by making it more strategic and thus more complicated, that is hack and slash and equals bad to her. The magic system and the combat in general, nothing special here. From November of 1996, the 150 best games of all time. Now, Ultima did not make the cut, at least not this one, but we can't talk about these games without mentioning the man himself, Lord British, one of the 15 most influential industry players of all time at number four. Richard Garriott virtually defined computer role-playing, having designed the most successful computer role-playing game series in history. Through the years, the Ultima series has broken new ground in graphics, artificial intelligence, character generation, object-oriented worlds, and story. And as early as the first game, here with Soft Talk again, we can see that he was building himself towards that eventual industry leader status, which he, of course, deserves. Love that uh, cape of code. Gary is certainly a one-off. Nobody like him. And I'm sure some people will be tempted to call it arrogance. And perhaps it is, but not all arrogance is necessarily bad. He recognized that there was a need in the computer industry for a rock star, and he personified it. With him it's for fun, and not only is he having fun, but we are also having fun seeing him as this Lord British character. As for Mundane, who is the only boss in the entire game, interesting because it's different, though I still beat him the first time. Here I am cutting in the death sequence, which I got later. He did suck most of the energy out of me right as the fight began, so scared me a little, but easy enough. Gotta be one of the first named ultimate bad guys to coin a Scorpia phrase there, and I enjoyed the history beating one of the first. Ultima is a legend, and it was legendary in its first incarnation. The magazines recognized not only this as a masterpiece, but they saw the future. What we can expect from Lord British in years to come is beyond imagination. One of the first, one of the easiest, one of the quickest took me less than a week. So why not start here? There's a decent economy, it's non-linear, open world, whatever faults there may be, it can probably be chalked up to age. A journey through space and time, highly recommended. Know that I, Lord British, hereby ordain that the entire realm of Sasaria be at thy service for all time henceforth, so let it be done. As for reviews to point you to, I think the most appropriate ones for the original Ultima would be Sword of Fargo and The Fairy Tale Adventure. Hillsfar sounds like another good one, and how about Jumpman for some more Commodore 64? Say hello to the ninth season, eight years of obscurity. I will see you all when I feel like it. Goodbye.